Hey, it's great to have all of you here. And I want to thank F FCA for um, the opportunity to talk about this important topic. But most, most especially, I want to thank USNI. I am now a proud 50-year pin-wearing old person for USNI. But, I, but I, I want to, first of all, say to all of you, thank you for being here because you, you could be a lot of places. And right now, you are, you are at a place that is looking at the human being and our cognitive abilities to, to fight and win and always be ahead of the adversary and looking at the brain as a weapon system. So it's great to have you all here. And we would invite you that after this panel, if you want to come up and have a more of a dialogue with our panelists, you're more than welcome to um, do that. So what an interesting topic. Neurons and networks. They both require interconnectivity. They both require a, a relationship, whether or not it is with neurons or with others in a network. They both are, are highly dependent upon a web of knowledge, and they both can die. So what we are after is understanding the neurons and the networks that will keep us not only alive, but also fighting the fight and winning the fight and about the cognitive readiness of our force. So along that line, we have four great panelists, and I'm privileged and honored to introduce them. Lieutenant General Matt Glavy, U.S. Marine Corps, is, is a deputy commandant for, in, for information. He's a Naval Academy graduate, a Marine aviator with many operational and staff tours, but of note, for the purposes of this panel, is not, not, not only what is he DCI, but he was the CG of the U.S. Marine Corps Forces, uh, the Cyberspace Forces, as well as the Deputy Director for Current Operations. And he is a fabulous thinker, and I consider him a friend and someone who has really, really helped me to think better faster, smarter, and more toward the warfighter. Along with him, we have Rear Admiral Doug Small. He is the Commander, Naval Warfare Information Systems Command here in San Diego, where he is responsible for 11,000 civilian and military professionals who design, develop, install, and support Navy's networking, communications, and information and the cyber capabilities and systems, and leading in the pursuit of fleet-wide connectivity through, oper through Operation Overmatch. Prior to this, he was a surface warfare officer, and I'm proud to say that not only was he a program manager in PEO I IWS, but Rear Admiral Small has a PhD from Naval Post, uh, from Naval Post Graduate School in physics, and we're proud to have him. And yes, and yes, if you look at his papers, he made great grades. <laughs> From the Defense Innovation Unit, we have Justin Norman, who is, who is the Acting Portfolio Director and Technical Director for AI and Machine Learning. Justin is also a Naval Academy graduate, and he, and he served in the Marine Corps, where he focused on systems analytics and device intelli intelligence. After that, he then joined the Civilian Corps and, he, and has been in, in industry, including Vice President of Data Science, Analytics, and Data Products at Yelp, also at Cloudera, Fast Forward Labs, at Fitbit, Cisco, and Booz Allen. He is a PhD candidate in computer science, not at NPS, but at UC Berkeley. We also have Lieutenant Zachary Riddis. Lieutenant Riddis is a, is a mechanical engineering PhD candidate at NPS. 
and his dissertation is titled Advanced Aluminum Alloy Fabrication Using Liquid Metal Jet Printing. As, as a submarine engineering duty officer, <clears throat> he plans to employ his research in submarine readiness and repair as part of the Submarine Industrial Base Initiative. Prior to coming to NPS, Zachary served on SSN US, USS Chicago and Louisville, SSN 724. So let's start the uh, questions. Lieutenant General Glavy, you have been somebody who has talked about scaling DevSecOps and the mindset in our thinking that is required to understand and use and leverage the talent and the technology and to end to develop that at scale as a command and control piece also. Could you talk about your mindset issues and how that's important to how we start this dialogue? Ma'am, thank you. And again, thanks for having me and inviting me uh, two years in a row. So pretty lucky to be on Admiral Rondeau's team. I also want to start by congratulating you, certainly your past leadership of the Naval Postgraduate School and all the success that you've seen. But more importantly, going forward, uh, that your continued service to that school and leadership of it, the Secretary of the Navy and the Undersecretary have chose wisely, ma'am, and it's, it's great uh, ha having you there. I'll just kind of give you a little insight of how important this is to the Marine Corps. As I've traveled around uh, the Marine Corps and my uh, billet here as a Deputy Commandant for Information, so if you're wondering what that is, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of, of intel, N2, N6-like stuff, along with cyberspace, along with influence operations, but taking information as a war fighting function. Uh, and as you know, you know, Admiral Paparo talked about the joint functions, and I know all the people in uniform know this, but uh, information is one of the seven joint war fighting functions. So it's important that we truly understand, and, and, and why that is important, that commanders and staffs if they don't plan to how they're going to use information uh, and then execute to it, right, they're, they're not going to be successful. That, that, that's really what it means to be a warfighting function is the fact that you're in the planning stages and the execution stages of what a commander has to do. Uh, I, 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 as I've developed this idea of, of how the Marine Corps, is, as I call it, is going to make their own luck, uh, in many respects. It's the ability to do things uh, with code, the ability to do things in this environment, uh, and, and to be able to do it when and where a commander needs it. Uh, we have started a, uh, a, uh, a capability we call the uh, Marine Corps Software Factory. Our director is Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Bach, uh, one of my heroes, and, and they have been able to prove, at, at small scale in this case, as a prototype, our ability to bring incredible Marines in and, and be able to make our own luck, to be able to create something from nothing. In addition to what we're doing at that level, we have Marines, based on the power of the Naval Postgraduate School, and, and if you didn't know this, the Marine Corps really relishes their, their MPS grads. You know, we screen and select in a very competitive environment who goes to Navy postgraduate school. And then we determine very early what they're gonna do on the backside. What deputy commandant, what agency, what command they're gonna work for. It's very, very deliberate, rightfully so. So we certainly wanna get a return on investment of this incredible talent uh, that you produce. But all these places as we go through force design, which is very information centric, all these epicenters of greatness where we see breakthroughs, uh, I'll be honest with you, there's, there's an MPS grad in the middle of it. And, you know, we, we do got to be able to scale, right? We probably can't do it totally from a Naval Postgraduate School model, but certainly we can start there. So as we th do things like talent management, as an exemplar, and we try to execute what's going to take place with respect to DevSecOps and, and other, other key factors to building an apparatus to do, you know, to bring all those capabilities together. So for instance, in, in the talent management model, just as an example, which is 
really signifies what we're trying to do. 13 different screens show up on a, 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 a monitor, uh, you know, in, in order to figure out what's, who is Glavy and what does Glavy do and what should Glavy do next. Very inefficient, very inefficient, right? Now our ability to bring all that data together, in this case is a single pane of glass, and now provide, right, what, you know, the monitor, uh, what our detailer needs in order to, to make the right decision about Glavy's future can be brought together. But, but getting this off the ground, you know, it sounds pretty easy as I describe it to you. You're probably thinking, that's not too hard, man, it's really hard. But having these Navy Postgraduate School expertise in those right places, I'll, I'll give you, for instance, Ryan Helm, Captain Ryan Helm, I just gave Ryan, a, or awarded Ryan a Copernicus Award yesterday, right? Uh, the FCA, uh, uh, U.S. Naval Institute sponsors the award, and, and I've been dealing with Ryan a lot. And Ryan, who's on this talent management team, uh, doing some really important re-enlistment models uh, for us, right, was one of the award winners. And Ryan, drum, drum roll please, is an infantry officer, right? Goes to her school, does amazing stuff, comes back to our beloved core, and while he was there at the school, developed uh, uh, this application, helicopter pilot, done eight Marine Expeditionary Units, and this is one of the hardest things, so when he was, you know, as I, as I saw the capability, but he was ba basically able to use uh, uh, modeling in order to determine all the planning required to do a very complex helicopter assault support mission, right, or, v or tilt rotor, uh, a more appropriately mission, right? In other words, you figure out what objective that you want, that's the start of the model, and now he was able to, to bring all that data together to determine the best place to land the force, the best insertion route into the force using defilade, and ultimately the best place to set your base of fire against using terrain, and then ultimately the best way to assault the position. I, I know that, you know, they used to take a lot of hours, right? Many hours, maybe many days to go through that. But to have a starting point like this that takes minutes really is a, is a powerful construct. We immediately added that application into our TAC, our tactical assault kit uh, capability. And now, you know, Ryan has made an incredible impact to our beloved core based on his ability to work in this environment. It's an example. Right? One, we got to determine scalability. Uh, this doesn't take anything away from our industry partnerships. Right? What Ryan did there is, is very focused on his mission, especially as an infantry officer, and something that fits perfectly into a model that we want to be able to do, you know, in this case, maybe near real time, right? Being able to make something from nothing because we have uh, uh, incredible Marines right, that, that, that have those skills and trade craft, but it, it's got to come from somewhere. You know, the Marine Corps has got to figure out how we are going to deploy that capability and, and then how do, we, how do we take it at scale. So ma'am, there's a lot more to that answer, but, but this is really about making your own luck. It's about Billy really creating something from nothing, but more importantly, having the skills and trade craft and the talent. To so do that. how do you look at that from a command and control point of view when it comes to the mindset and the C2 and the speed and the pace and, and the, the fury and the complexity in a C2 environment? So, uh, you know, it's, it's not only about C2, it's all about C2. Command and control, really the essence of gets to decision making, right? I mean, that is the core piece of how commanders ultimately command and control. Uh, in the past, you know, and, and not sorry, we've been very much uh, from the gut, right? Uh, experience matters, all that, all that matters. You know, you know the, the running uh, declarative at the basic school is, what are you gonna do now, Lieutenant, right? Based on their limited experience. Now, in, in this environment, right, you know, we have the opportunity to, to make good decisions, like really start off at a, a foundation of a good decision, data informed, bringing data into the discussion in, in order to make sure that that commander who's, or, or leader who's making a decision has everything, because how many times that, you know, we don't do that and we make awkward decisions and, and you know, may not have the experience, may not have all that gut 
that's required to make decisions. So the ability to bring that data together, aggregate it in, in the manner and fashion, whether it's a non-combatant evacuation operation that requires certain data about you know, local populace, infrastructure, and other key things, or, or, or targeting, right? There's a certain aspect that's required to bring that together in, in order to make the best decision. And that's what we want to do, right? Command and control is, is how does one gain that decision advantage in a timely fashion, combining it with experience to, to, to get ultimately gain that, that advantage. I hope that helps. Absolutely. We talked about you wanting to ask any, any of our panelists a uh, question. So have that there. I do. Uh, I would uh, love general. to ask a question. So I've been on this, uh, this dream job with uh, watching Doug Small and all the work he's done down at NAV War. And I really think he's changed the culture. You know, I'm an aviator. We live or die by black boxes. God knows how long they take to get through the testing process. And I won't bore you or, or anything. But, but what Doug has done for the Navy and the Marine Corps, for that matter, through his overmatch conscience, is truly bring software to bear, right? Software as a main effort, software as, as, as ultimately the pacing capability. So Doug, my question is, you, do we stand a chance to make hardware a small H and make software a capital S? Is it possible, Doug Small? Well, the only possible answer is yes, with, with, <laughs> that, with that kind of question. Yes. And is it, is it easy? No. Um, but absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, kind of, you know, one of the themes that's been, at least through the discussions I've been having, is this idea of disruption. And for anybody who, hopefully, hopefully everybody's familiar with the paper, uh, software is eating the world. There's a lot of industries out there who never saw software taking their place as an application who are no longer with us. Um, it, 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 the move towards software-centric everything is a critical first step in being able to disrupt and change the way we do business. Everything from the unmanned systems that we all want to get uh, autonomous behaviors in them, um, you name it, it's all software-centric. Uh, cybersecurity, just staying ahead of adversaries. You've got to get software abstracted from hardware and move those changes faster than the adversary can keep up. So yes, I do believe I do believe it's possible. I believe it's necessary, and I think we're showing together a path forward, um, you know, to get at that based on what we currently have and how can we grow that into hardware that supports a software-centric uh, Navy and Marine Corps. So when you're over match hat, Admiral. Um, and you've been wrestling with codifying and then trying to deliver decision advantage. What are your top principles or, or, or outcomes that you see happening so that the ability of our, our commanders and our tactical decision makers to outthink the adversary constantly, actively, um, and currently, not in legacy, but right on time and to be able to, to do that. What are your main principles for outcomes in that regard? So, um, so Admiral Paparo talked about it this morning, yeah, you know, did. decision superiority he and, did. you know, very eloquently, you know, let's say making better decisions faster than the adversary can keep up. Um, you know, in our business, you, get, you have to be able to, you, you have to, you know, the commander has to make a decision and then you have to be able to promulgate that decision, which is typically an order which means you have to have the networking and communications capability to get that out there. But one the, you know, from the systems command perspective and the overmatch, what we've been trying to do is how do you measure decision advantage? What we, we throw that term around, but how do we measure it? And some of that is getting into you know, how do commanders make decisions? The processes that General Glavy just talked through about how you plan and how you, you all these you know, exquisite missions require people planning out for you know, some period of time how am I going to move the people and the and the the the, um, the platforms and the the weapons and everything else into place? How am I going to communicate? All of that stuff is part of a, a um, deliberate process that we that we take to uh, planning those operations. So the first step for us is let's understand that process. How do commanders make decisions? And then do what we do with everything. Let's bring some model-based engineering and other type talent to that make sure we understand how that works and then where are those 
uh, sort of the choke points that could use some work, whether it's you know exposing data for that typically wasn't just exposed that people have to make a phone call for or something, um, an application to you know maybe speed up a workflow, whatever, whatever it is, observe the process in place and then do what you can to, to speed that up um, to, to really to enable another thing Admiral Paparo talked about, which is allow machines to do what they do best and give the humans back their time to do what they do best, um, which is analyze and make decisions. So you, want, you have a question that you want to ask a panelist? I, I do, but my question was to you, Admiral, um, if you're okay, okay. with that. Okay. <laughs> so, but, and, and it kind of goes with, with, that, with that discussion from General Glavy and, and the way I, I just talked about our thinking on decision advantages. The whole idea is to take a lot of the, the grind work out of the decision-making process to allow humans to have you know, the, the uh, space to analyze and whatnot. And I'm thinking that probably puts a premium on education of those commanders and of the people that are part of that process. And so my question is really for you, um, are you seeing that as, and from your perch and what are things that uh, NPS is doing to get at that? So when you get into a, to a graduate level of work, you're talking about master's level of work in, in the terms of the mastery of the craft. So there's an assumption that when people come into NPS, they have in some manner a mastery of their proficiency in their craft. What we then do, do is then expand knowledge, Admiral. And the knowledge is, is what, we are, what, we, what we are, are trying to not only understand in a more sophisticated way the mastery, but also then to apply it. So I look at, at NPS as a sandbox for really testing what you know and testing what you don't know and to understanding where you fail, succeed, try again, reset, un understand, and to do it quickly. And so there is an alacrity of application that the graduate experience should be giving to the warfighter so that he or she has learned something and has learned more, a combination of their experience, their mentors around them, and then what they're learning for knowledge. And a backbone, so that we become a backbone that, that then takes it from, from, from the classroom to the warfighter, to the fleet and the force, bring it back, but know how to test theories and how to test assumptions and to be very comfortable with the need to reset. And if we can do that, then you get in, into the warfighter some adaptation and some agility. So that's what I would say is in short to, to the question. Okay, did I do okay, Admiral? You did, okay. absolutely. General, did I, did I do okay? Okay. I'm gonna be sure that I, I'm good in front of my own mentors here. So, Justin Norman, I'm gonna to go to, 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 to him next, uh, uh, Zach. And you're a most interesting guy. So when we talk about what Admiral Paparo said and the CNO said, they both said it, is that in some ways, and I'll use my phrases, we're all warfighters. We're all in this war, in this battle, for ideas and for and the narrative and for and for the freedom of thought and the and the ability to create, innovate, and imagine. So you are that kind of person who is who was a uh, marine, served the nation really well, then goes to industry. And so I'm I'm curious about still a marine, no man. and he's still a marine. Yeah, I, exactly. got, I got I got. So I t I began this with a general talking about mindset. Could you talk about mindset when it comes to the innovation culture in industry? Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I think uh, it really gets at the heart of, of what the actual change is. I think when we talk about innovation, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about the output, the thing that you get when the innovation is done, as opposed to the process it takes to actually get to the, that point, which is actually repeatable, it is teachable. Uh, and it's something that there's a, quite a, a bit of knowledge uh, out in the ecosystem uh, to be able to learn from. So from a mindset perspective perspe uh, specifically, I think what's important to keep in mind is that innovation is by definition uncomfortable. Uh, if we were doing things well or to the degree of intensity that we expected for the outcome we wanted, we wouldn't need to go through an innovation process. 
So by definition, there's going to be uh, a need for change management, but in a way that, that if you want to go quickly, probably won't feel super comfortable for, for, the, for the people that are incumbent. And so if you look at you know, what happens in Silicon Valley and look at what happens in industry, typically, you, again, get the outputs. Take Steve Jobs, for example. I think a classic uh, Silicon Valley example at Apple. Uh, we think, we see, hear about think the iPhones, the iPads, the iOS, the music, all the wonderful things that we use every day. But in that moment where he was in exile um, from the company uh, and was contemplating what his vision would be for the future of this unified computing platform, and then was brought back in through a, you could call a corporate violent uh, scenario, uh, no one really talks about that first six months to a year. And that first six months to a year actually uh, involved quite a bit of of change, and when I, when I say change, I mean a lot of people lost their jobs or a lot of executives who were in very prominent positions were no longer in those prominent positions. And he didn't do that to be cruel, although there's many, you know, there's a lot of lore about how it was to be in a, in a room with him. He did it because unity of effort, vision, uh, was the goal for producing something truly amazing. And he recognized that having those barriers in place and having that, that, that old group think in place would have made it impossible uh, to, to get to that outcome. And so as we think about what mindset we're looking for, as we you know, look through the DOD, look at how we're gonna grow, we're, we're, we're now facing challenges that are, you know, are, are quite frankly, uh, you know, when I think about them, some of the most difficult things that the, the, the government, uh, that the DOD, and that our civilian industrial base have ever undertook. So we can't go into it with the same mindset. We can't use the same tools, uh, and we can't use the same innovation processes. So the question is, what do we need to shed in order to move faster? Uh, and that mindset uh, about what can we actually make room for is something that I really have found to be quite effective. So here's a chance there, Maureen. Do you want to ask either the Admiral or the General a question about mindset or anything else you want to ask? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a good theme to continue on. I actually want to ask uh, you know, both the Admiral and the, and the General a question. So, you know, we've heard from Admiral Paparo, from Admiral Aquilino before, before him about all of these, you know, uh, challenging problems that we need unity of effort on. So uh, things like the replicator program, uh, the joint fires network. And I think we actually have a, a fair degree of, of unity of, of effort and understanding from industry, uh, understanding from our partners in the DOD, and, and also uh, now from the supporting establishment. So we, we actually have the yes. But we have to go much faster and at a much larger scale than I think has been envisioned in the past. So what happens when you get to that point where you have the funding, you have the, you know, the, the unit of effort, you have the mission, uh, but you, you need to do something at a scale and a speed that hasn't been done before? What barriers do you have and how do you get, get through them? I'll take the first bite and then hand it to Doug for the real answer. Uh, I, I will tell you, and I, this is a cop out, but, but you know, the process isn't in our favor. So we're gonna, I'm gonna make decisions here in the next, we, the Marine Corps, the Commandant's gonna make decisions here in the next few months that, that really, we're not gonna execute for two and a half years. I mean, it is mind boggling how we even do as well as we do. Luckily we have guys like Doug, but, but this is really an awkward, you know, you, you, great example about Apple and how fast even Jobs could operate, right? He did have, you know, he had unity. He was, he was a dictator, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's not a great word. But, but you get my point, to move decisively. You know, it doesn't necessarily work that way. Uh, to be quite honest, I'll give you an example, example, right? As we were putting talent management together, right, I mentioned, oh, well, that's not too hard. You got this data source, you got that data source, you get some uh, APIs in place, you, you have an environment that you're gonna operate in, you do some of this magic of, of algorithms. But guess what? That, that took rdt and &E money from, a, from a, a, a research development, test and evaluation money, a, a, a type of money that's not in execution, right? So I, I, we had to wait. You know, the commandant says, I want it to go now. And of course, we go to Congress and, you know, we, you know, bended knee and, and try to get that money changed over in, in uh, execution year reprogramming and not easy, by the way. So sometimes the system is against us. The, the other thing that's against us is us, right? We talked about this. Do we really understand, and I'm looking in the mirror at the senior leader decision making level, what's got to be done, mm -hmm. right? 
What, what has to be done? How, how is this back to software, back to black boxes? I don't have time for the content of that black box. I don't have time for the net flow or the interaction or the architecture or, or what's going to happen in that black I just want damn black boxes. It's got to provide an outcome that I need time now, ready, go. And so what's catching up to us is that may have worked in a in a slower technology period, that shit don't work today. You know it, I know it. You know, we're at the 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Speed of light is, is where we're operating in many respects because that's, uh, that's what's available and that's how fast our data is, is moving. And if we don't take full advantage of that, right, we're, we're going to be in an awkward spot. So a lot of excuses there. There is no doubt there's got to be a cultural mindset. I, I think the Deputy Secretary of Defense is, is forcing that upon the services. And, you know, and, and for me, in a very positive way, you know, I've had to live this life, and, and Admiral Rondeau talked about it. I'm a very average helicopter pilot, right? And so I uh, enter into this world, and, you know, for the most part, you know, I find myself to be, you know, the dumbest guy in the room. And so I'm in this learning mode all the time. So what, you know, th this, this disruption is advantageous for me to understand really in, in order for me to do my job. But that isn't necessarily the norm and nor Glavy, you know, just being a helicopter pilot would truly understand what we're trying to get after and how important what Doug does and, 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 and DIU and others do. So that, that's, again, probably more excuse than, than how do we fix it. But, but this, this ain't going to be easy. And change is hard. I, I won't even go there. But it is a very, it sounds easy, man, but, but it ain't easy. So, all right, Doug, over to you. Uh, wow. Um, so I, I'll, I guess I'll just say um, I love Replicator. I think the way it came about is is fantastic. Um, to General Glavy's point, DSD trying to force some change uh, on a on a organization that's not really all that you know uh, willing to change all that often, and just kind of hey, let's we're going to go do this. Um, we have been you know. It's, it, we have been partnered with DIU, I don't know if you knew that or not, but you know, on this software journey um, through some of your uh, organizations to really drive some of the, the software-centric aspects of Replicator. In my mind, it's our focus on the software and the algorithms that get the behaviors that we need are the thing that will allow us to scale. I think you know, when, I, when we talk about disruption, you know, it's, it, we, could, we can wait the time that it takes to build a new warship or we can buy commercial vessels in huge quantities and strap whatever it is we need on them, whether it's a sensor or an explosive, and achieve a similar effect. The focus has to be on the software and make sure that that's the part that's constantly improving so that we don't care about the vehicle, right? And we can move that at scale. So. I think it's a I think it's a, a wonderful initiative. I think that um, you know, as a department, we we have to. Um, I won't even try to recall the size of the budget. It's a lot. We need to think of it in an abundance mindset, right? Well, I, I talk all the time. I, I don't know if um, you know our installation team. I always say there's 11,000 nav warriors aligned to install our systems on time. I don't care what it is that is in your job description, your role is getting our stuff installed on time. We have to have an abundance mindset and let's achieve this thing. We have a lot of people that do a lot of work in unmanned systems and all these other things. Let's get them aligned and driving toward delivering on behalf of Pack Fleet. So I love it. So I have the privilege of being the president of, N, of NPS. And one of the great opportunities there is to meet 1,500 warrior scholars a day, and they are the lieutenants and the captains and the majors and the lieutenant colonels and the ensigns. And that is what drives me to want to advance NPS faster, better, and higher. But at this table, I on purpose had introduced myself as a 50-year veteran of the Navy in, in many ways. But as a country, we saw problems multi-generationally. So the next speaker is Lieutenant Zach Ritas. And when you hear him, you're going to, you're going to know why I say this to them all the time. You're not a future leader. You are a leader now. So, Zach, along that line, I have a long multi-syllable um, 
question <laughs> for you. As a current NPS, PhD level student, you are, we, and we know this, deeply focused on the applications of disruptive technology like additive manufacturing. Matter of fact, you briefed Admiral Paparo about that work this past week. And you talk about, about the direct application to the fleet and working to understand the experiences of those applications. So let us know a, a bit about what you're doing and how can the unique collaborative environment that you have, that, that network, of uh, multiple neurons coming together with, with your team and how they're working in the additive manufacturing problems. Over to you. Well, thank you, President Rondeau. And uh, first, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be on such an illustrious panel here with these fine gentlemen. Uh, so as everybody can probably figure out in this room, I'm the, uh, definitely the youngest person on the, uh, the proverbial totem pole here. And that's how I'd like to start off uh, right now. Uh, as, a, uh, for, as a junior officer serving aboard two of fast attack submarines, uh, I came to NPS as a newly minted engineering duty officer with a very, you know, I, I knew how the submarine force thought. I thought I kind of knew how the engineering duty officer community works, and that's just two of the many communities in the Navy. Not to mention how Marines think, the Air Force thinks, and how they operate. So that's, that's, that's a good environment, though, to be thrown into at the Naval Postgraduate School as a brand new junior officer. Uh, so in addition to my, uh, so setting that scene, I, I, do the, uh, I do a lot of research in metal additive manufacturing, as the president mentioned. Uh, that work is progressing well under my uh, supervisor, uh, Dr. Emery Gundes. Uh, but I also wear some hats as the uh, student member for the Consortium for Advanced Manufacturing Research and Education, as well as the Navy Innovation Center Additive Manufacturing Lead. And uh, those are both managed by my supervisor as well, too. Now, what I briefed Admiral Paparo about uh, and what he cares about as the Pacific Fleet Commander is how are we bringing metal additive manufacturing to help the fleet? And the way we're doing that is, is really threefold. So number one, uh, we're, trying to, we're working to increase the operational availability, or the ACE of O, of fleet units by identifying and producing parts that are suitable for additive manufacturing. And the way we do that is I lead a group of uh, submariners, surface warfare officers, marines, aviators, because I'm, I'm learning about those communities, but there's still a lot of, lot of learning to be done. Uh, and what we do is we, we identify case studies, say, hey, this valve broke and it took us three months to find a spare, or this part was, we had to DFS, so depart from specification this system, because we couldn't get you know, a, a two pound valve stem. And we can really produce these via additive manufacturing techniques. And the exciting thing, uh, ma'am, is that we, as you're aware, and as I like to tell everybody else in here, uh, NPS is we are becoming the premier uh, added manufacturing hub on the West Coast. We, on April 2nd, we're actually opening our brand new facility, which is gonna have a brand new, um, I won't bore you with the details, but a lot of really great uh, metal AM technologies uh, some laser systems, laser powder bed systems, uh, fully subtractive systems with integrated metal AM uh, print heads, a uh, new uh, CT and digital radiography scanner that I just spent the, the last week learning how to use, which is an incredible te uh, technique. Uh, so with all those te techniques, and then we're going to have a follow-on AM summit April 3rd through the 4th with NAVC 05T and uh, I believe SWOBOS will be providing, presiding over that. That's going to be really a great way, and we're going to have all these uh, technologies at NPS working to produce these parts and working hand-in-hand -hand with NAVC and the other ICS to get them certified for use on ships and submarines. Now, that was number one. Now, number two and three are kind of go together, and that's battle damage repair and contested logistics. Now, to get to both of those, uh, this coming year, NPS is going to be working uh, in the upcoming Swarmex, Trident Warrior, and RIMPAC operations in the Indo-PACOM AOR. We're going to be, uh, we have the, all these systems that I just spoke of can be containerized and produced and made into expeditionary units sent aboard ships or at shore, such as Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard and some LPDs and LHDs, so amphibious assault ships. And we're going to be printing and fixing parts during these exercises to showcase the technologies. And myself and other NPS students, as well as Naval Reservists, will be involved in these efforts. Now, those are the three ways. So increased ace of O, contested logistics, and battle damage repair. And the reason why we can do that at NPS, really, is because 
you, you can't rely on a junior officer with a uh, submarine background to do all that, because I'll, I'll be going to an LPD for the first time ever on Friday to work with our containerized system there. So I'm not the right person to ask where the ship, where that needs to go and how it's going to interface, but we have the students at NPS that can help with that effort, and together we can innovate together to fix these and make this better, ma'am. So before I give you a chance to ask a, a question, Justin, wh what do you have to ask Zachary? Um, from, from what perspective? Anything you want. Okay. Well, uh, I, I actually am um, I'm just struck uh, by how much uh, uh, progress they're making uh, along all these dimensions. So I, I actually have the privilege of sitting on the D Department of Navy's S&T board. Um, and one of the thorniest problems we've run into is how to actually integrate additive manufacturing into the, not just design, but remediation maintenance process. There's a lot of inertia, as you might imagine, um, not necessarily in the directions uh, that we would want. Um, but we had this really incredible conversation about, you know, actually thinking about what the testing process needs to look like in the future yeah. in order to accommodate yeah. new parts that are developed in a, a, yeah. at a, at a, at a new material sense. And so the whole time my mind was racing about, well, you know, how do I get uh, officers like this in yeah. rooms like that, uh, where, their, uh, where their input is not just going to be you know, something that people can reference, but is driving the conversation and eventually the investment uh, for, for where uh, we go uh, in the future. And so you know, I, I really think that I'm quite bullish on, on seeing what you're building, but also bring your friends uh, from all the other services that have their individual experiences and how that gets applied in the concept operations uh, in, their, in their specific area of, of, of knowledge. So we're, working um, so, more, yeah, so we're working more closely with, with DIU every day, and we're, and we're signing an MOA with them, a MOA with them, and we're going to be doing some things together. So, Zach, you get to ask a, a question to anybody you want. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have a question uh, for Admiral Small and for uh, Justin Norman, actually. So kind of building on what we were talking about with innovating and being disruptive. So, Admiral, uh, with... You're, you're incredible. I mean, going back to what I said, where we have a bunch of different communities in the Navy and then different branches of service, everybody kind of has their different processes and they're all slightly different with their own lexicon of acronyms, uh, our, our favorite three letter acronyms, of course. So, that's a, so making a standard IT and communications architecture is a, a Herculean task for overmatch. So how can the environment of NPS assist with innovating and helping to solve those problems for you? And then uh, for Mr. Norman, uh, with your experience at DIU, in industry, in the Marine Corps, and now as a PhD candidate at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, what are some best practices that you've experienced that could possibly be put in place at uh, NPS? Uh, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, how can, how can NPS help? Um, look, I think uh, there's, there's a number of ways. Um, just the education mission and getting people, um, just frankly raising the educational level of you know all of us, I think is a is a is a huge first step. Um, there are some of the departments, as you well know, at NPS who directly contribute to the work that that goes on at NAVOR and certainly as part of uh, Project Overmatch, but even some of the things kind of going back to my first point on the some of the departments that you may not equate um, you know with with the networking and things like that but just some of the data analytics or space operations and things like this you know one, one of the one of the neat things about sort of the the world we're in with um, with commercial software availability and things is we we now have a better we are better able to unleash their creativity when they are in the fleet in whatever job they're in, whether it's you know building applications um, to solve really hard problems using uh, data analytics, uh, General Glavy talked about their the software factory. There's a whole cadre of people that are learning some pretty high-end chops in, in software. Um, the space teams are are doing some incredible work, and they all contribute uh, in their own way. The school itself, as you know, we, we've entered into an agreement and are helping us directly on a whole bunch of things to include a lot of the uh, unmanned and, and other types of work. So I hope that I hope that helps. But I think more more education is better. 
and it's hard to measure how much better it is, but it is, it's better. When machines, when we turn over to machines to do what they do best, it needs to be some really smart human beings that are making those decisions and have that time uh, to do that. Thank you, sir. So, uh, once again, I, I think I'm going to, you know, talk about how bullish I am about the, the talent that I see coming out of, of this pipeline, but I think we need to get it into some, some you know, larger and more, more expensive locations within not just industry, but also throughout the force. Uh, for me, when I was at Yelp, if I could have had uh, one or two NPS, uh, you know, candidates or grads, uh, a lot of what I was working on in ad tech rhymes with uh, open source intelligence gathering. Uh, and so the techniques we were working on, uh, the models that we developed, would have been really great uh, collaborations and I think would have been uh, a scenario which coming back into the force would have added a lot of value. Um, so what are those you know, types of collaborations we can do going forward that leverage uh, our partnerships in industry in the defense industrial base uh, and what you're doing at MPS would be one area that I, that I would focus on. And I know there are programs that do that, but more than one or two people, you know, making that a rotation that, that uh, a large volume of, of graduates go through is, is an area that I think would be very helpful. Um, the other part has to do with continuing research. Uh, so I think one of the things that I, I think is so powerful is uh, once you have uh, you know, your expertise and your knowledge buoyed up by, by what you learn in school, expanding that uh, to uh, going back into the fleet, recognizing even more problems, and then publishing back, uh, and, and having that uh, as, as an advocate or being an advocate for that actually drives things that DIU might be able to invest in going forward. Uh, and so uh, I'm always kind of on the lookout for not only what are the, you know, the industry uh, the capabilities that we have, but also what am I, what am I seeing as a demand signal uh, from inside of the force. And oftentimes, you know, it, it's those who have gone through that, that training and education process inside that have the, the best mechanisms for communicating it. And so I, I would encourage, uh, especially as you go back to the fleet, for you to uh, be uh, the, the advocate uh, for the investment, be the advocate for uh, the scale, be the advocate for the partnership between industry uh, and between the Department of Defense, because you're actually uniquely situated uh, between all three communities. So I'm going to bring this back around to the last question for General Glaving. So all of this is conversation. We have industry here and higher ed here. We have uh, militaries and other departments here. And we're all in this West exhibition, learning about each other and learning about new technology and having great networking. But in the end, if it's not about the warfighter, we should cease doing this. And so this is about the warfighter overall. I'd like you to, to bring it back, bring back all of the conversations and the dialogue to why we are here and what, why it's important and what we must produce and must develop and must deliver for the warfighter. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we talked about Replicator, right? Deputy Secretary of Defense pushing hard to get unmanned autonomous capabilities in the hands of operators, almost like she's clairvoyant. Why? So I mentioned it earlier today, I'm 60 years old, so I get up every night at two o'clock in the morning, and how hard I don't want to look at my phone, I do. So last night I did, and there's 16 text messages on there for, again, another example of why this discussion is so important, where an inferior force used asymmetric capabilities based on our ability to adapt to this environment and severely damaged a superior force. We've seen this a lot, repeat in history. So in this case, you know, some souped up jet skis loaded with uh, pl plenty of explosives end up sinking, you know, a tens of millions of dollars Russian ship. This is twice in two weeks. Uh, it's, it's an incredible model. And uh, people, you know, eh, well, that, that can't happen to us or, you know, that's not the reality of peer competition. I, I can't disagree more. Uh, the, the power of our ability, in this case, of, of their ability to execute move, counter move, move, counter move, right? We see it all the time. We've seen it play out in front of us uh, is, is magical. And it's all the power of our earlier discussion of software, those capabilities that, you know, the, the object of execution 
a souped up jet ski, hoorah, right? insightful, but, but the magic is the innovation, what happens inside that damn thing. And certainly the asymmetric advantage is the fact that when I looked at it, you know, there's four million views, right? I mean, that's how fast this stuff is happening. And though there's gonna be another day and more to this fight, but the ability now to use this innovative skills that we, we do so well at Monterey Right, in order to get practical application from a war fighting standpoint and tie that into what Deputy Secretary of Defense needs us to do in Replicator, right? I mean, hint, hint, right? We, we got to be able to adapt, we got to move, and we got to operate, you know, faster than our adversary, back, back to decision superiority. So, ma'am, I, I will tell you there, there is a continuous application of this from a war fighting standpoint, only constrained by our imagination and sometimes our processes and procedures. But, but, you know, the, we're, we're going to have these leaders like her and, and others, certainly, Admiral Paparo in that, in, in that list, General Smith in that list, and others. They're going to force us to get out of a comfort zone and really adapt to things uh, that are different, right? This, this idea that everyone's, everything's an ACAT-1 program is going to take the next dozen years of our lives to produce is just not, you know, it's, it's a necessity. But it's not going to be the asymmetric advantage that we need in, in order to, to ensure our place in this world. So uh, just my thoughts, ma'am, based on your, your war fighting well, thank, question. Sir, thank you for your leadership. And with neurons and networks we, and, the, and the dialogue, we can confirm that education is a war fighting platform because our people need that. So General, Admiral Small, Lieutenant, and Justin. Thank you very much for your contributions to this conversation. Thank you. Hey, Zach, where'd you get the ring? College football ring. Okay, yeah, anybody no. want to ask them anything? Just come on up. Ivy, uh, okay. Ivy League champions from my U Penn. Wow. Penn. Yep. That's awesome. I only wear it when I'm wearing a fancy uniform. <laughs> I'm getting a look. Does anybody want to ask them questions? The microphone? Okay, let's go. I'm getting a look. I got a signal and I'm getting a look. So go ahead. Sorry. You're at it. Hi, my name is Catherine Carter. I'm from Tritus. We are actually the original CSFC solution. And this is such a great panel because um, Peter Denning, um, who teaches an innovation class that our founder actually took when he, um, and it was his favorite class. Um, he said, an innovation is a transformation of practice in a community. And so when he took that class at Naval Postgraduate School and he interacted with the military people that he interacted with, he started problem solving. And that he, when he went and went out into the field and started looking at you know, the traditional type one encryption and seeing how we can make that in commercial, you get commercial solutions for classified. And he created the first wireless device in a SCIF. And he has never forgotten the lessons that he had from his favorite class, both Professor Dennings that he took, and, the, and he's never stopped innovating because it really is about a transformation of communities. So where do you see taking that use case and applying it so that we get more of those people to really problem solve and have that synergy that happens at Naval Postgraduate School that happened for him? I'm happy to, oh, go ahead. No, no. Admiral Small. I, I'll, I'll start, and uh, you know, I think it kind of goes to like what Admiral Rondeau talked about as NPS as a sandbox, and it's an opportunity for people to be able to go out and do things like break records for biggest number of drone swarms and things like that, and build, you know, stuff like this as a, as a student, right? Um, it, it's, a, it's a sandbox to do that. Then our thing as leaders has to be, when they get out of NPS, encourage that continued behavior, right? Maybe even require it. It sat on a desk, it sat on a shelf for three years collecting dust Yeah. until I mean, leadership it, asked for it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where, and the Navy's been on this journey um, of seek, seeking out opportunities to remove barriers for people, and that's, that's the way we need to to change that culture, we have to change that mindset that that's our job, is to remove barriers for people like Zach to be able to bring these ideas uh, to bear. And um, 
Thank you, Admiral. And, and if I may, I, I think um, there is, I think if our ed educators need to also like encourage and enable their students to kind of, just what Justin said, you know, when you leave NPS, stay plugged in with the work you had do you've done. So when I leave, hopefully with my PhD in a little less than a year, I, um, I'll be going to one of the naval shipyards. And right now we're doing a whole bunch of collaborations with the shipyards to try to, you know, get a, uh, added manufacturing more streamlined into ship and submarine repair processes. Now, there's a lot of, uh, we can make parts all day, but the, the really the big issue is certification, especially on submarines with all the level one nuclear sub-safe boundaries that we could spend the rest of this panel talking about right now. But really having the initiative and like the ownership to, you know, drive yourself to hopefully into a career path that is suited to your research and work is also an important part of the equation too. Hopefully that answers or helps you answer your question too. It does, and thank you for the work you do at Naval Postgraduate School. It left an impression, and he's still innovating. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Johnson. I go by TJ. I'm a senior pressure engineer at uh, Marine Corps Tactical System Support Activity. Uh, I'm passively familiar with some of the initiatives that are on at the, at the table here. And one of the questions I have is we talked about, number one, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for your time, everyone. Uh, we talked about replicator. Uh, I know about some of the things that we're talking about in overmatch. I know some of the things we're talking about, uh, DCI's initiatives with mission partner environments, those types of things. So we talk about innovation, we're talking about this robot force that's gonna be doing stuff and things. So how do we, how do you, we think about, or how are you all thinking about that, that data from an innovation perspective? Because we don't know how to do that today, right? We don't know how to do that at scale today. How do we think about that data that they're going to have to offload somewhere? How does the network how, how does the network support that? Or the, the infrastructure, I don't want to say the network because that leads in a direction, but how does the infrastructure support that? And then we talk about AIML. How do we take advantage of the AIML that's going to have to be able to do that at scale? So I, those three things there. And then looking at the lieutenant, how do I recruit and maintain and sustain the skill sets that I don't have, right? That, that I know I don't have, and I won't be around long enough to mature that but how do we bring the lieutenant in that, that civilian workforce with that skill set? How do we bring them in uh, to be able to innovate our way to a solution with the shot clock that we have? Thank you. Hey, this is a trick, because TJ is one of the smartest guys that we have working in the Marine Corps. He knows the answer to these questions already, so he's testing us. Right. So he's testing us. Right. I know what you're doing, brother. But uh, I'm going to let Admiral Small answer that question, because he can give you an answer. <laughs> well, there was so much in there. I was, I was thinking the same thing. I know this guy, and I know, well, I know what's coming. Uh, look, I'll, I'll, I'll start on the people side, if you will, and I'll just kind of repeat what CNO talked about yesterday. So in the Navy, you know, we're looking at creating a robotics rating. So, you know, I think the first thing is we recognize it's a different type of rating is required to be able to interact with these uh, unmanned systems. I think... Um, kind of to the question earlier about scale. If we continue to, you know, we talk about unmanned systems, right? They're not, they're not unmanned. We just move the humans, right? We moved them to buildings somewhere and then we require the networks to move the data all over. Um, typically, right, there are, there are RPVs. So we have to think about how can we move more of those smarts out onto the vehicle and offload the networks and offload those rooms of humans and make it a, just an extension of sort of how we do business. To your larger point, that means we have to do the right things when it comes to the data, data harvesting and, and you know, collating and labeling and all the other stuff that we have to do, creating those models and getting them fielded. Um, yeah, we're not there, but, but we're working on it and we're working on it in an iterative fashion. So we have stuff out there, we've been learning. Now it's let's take what we've learned, iterate on it, make it better and just continue, continue driving it. If you wouldn't mind, I, I, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, so my other job uh, that I'm dual-hatted with is actually the, be the CTO for the Joint Mission Accelerator in Endopaycom. So I, I spent a lot of time thinking about integration, and I spent a lot of time thinking about integration specifically within the autonomous force that we're building into a communications network that is going to be distributed, federated out into not just our joint force, but also into the partner environment. There are, are, are a number of challenges, not the least of which is 
uh, we, we know that there are going to be uh, challenges with consistent communications at the high bandwidth that we expect. Uh, there are going to be multiple pathways uh, in which the communications occurs. And so having platforms that are resilient to any change in their, in their ecosystem from a communication perspective, but also understand uh, the difference in fidelity of the data that they bring through uh, uh, and, and are able to still make decisions, whether they be HIDL or, or, or they be fully autonomous, is incredibly important. The way that we're going to get at this and that we are getting at this is by testing it and bringing our industry partners in pl into place before you know, it's a fully baked solution, but in an experimentation concept and then validation concept and then bringing in the, these principles and policies as we continue to at scale uh, uh, to, to get towards the, uh, the outcomes here. The other piece that I would talk about is your, is your, your comment about AI, AIML. So uh, I lead the AI portfolio at DI, DIU. Think about this quite a bit. There are unique requirements, but at the end of the day, a lot of the AI capabilities that we're really trying to implement here, uh, it's the operations component of it, the software engineering component of it, uh, that's actually the, the, the tricky part. The modeling components, we have metrics, we have uh, you know, ITR requirements that we can lean on, but making those work uh, from a DevOps perspective and testing those in the environments they will be in uh, is, not, is a new skill set. And so, again, we have uh, the ability to lean on what industry has done uh, in an environment that maybe is pr more permissive but a larger scale uh, and then to uh, customize that for our specific applications. There are a lot of people, as you know, working on this problem, uh, but I think the right answer is that we've got to get in there and actually uh, start to work out the kinks themselves rather than talking in theory about it. Uh, Your piece about Zach, you, retaining. you've got to answer his question also. TJ's question about... Retaining talent. Oh, uh, yes, sir. So re about retaining talent, I mean, I think that the most important part, I mean, the reason why I'm still in the Navy, I mean, I have a strong sense of patriotism, but I also have been able to, I mean, I've been pretty challenged at, at NPS, and with my experiences on a submarine, half of which, which was in the shipyard, seeing a problem, you know, which in that case was shipyard maintenance delays, and a lot of that is due to parts inavailability. So that's where I see a, a huge advantage for what I'm doing research on, and it's something I'm passionate about because uh, how much time and energy it would save, you know, fellow, my, you know, submariners and other sailors in the fleet. So that's another, I think that's really driving hard at the, uh, how we retain the talent is kind of, I mean, at the end of the day, the Navy, we have to give people orders to go places. But if people can be intelligently slotted into places where they have a passion and an aptitude for, then that, that's pretty crucial, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, we got one more Thank you much. one more question. Thanks, TJ. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Dan Grunup from Naval Information Warfare Center Pacific. My question is to both the military and industry here. If anything was uh, was actually uh, given or came across in these conferences, it's the sense of urgency of our needs out in the fleet and also in industry. My question is about is about the uh, the pipeline of getting the, the skilled people into the industry and what we need out in the fleet. My question, what, how do you reach out to that midshipman or that officer candidate so that when they go out into the fleet, that they hit the deck plates running? Not They're not in the uh, academic concept, but actually ready to stand that watch and an industry ready to operate in there and to go to the use cases and provide those uh, solutions. So there's two parts to that, I think. One is the talent management that must accompany everything that you've heard. And that's every service is working on different ways of looking at talent management. For instance, at Admiral Small said they have now in the Navy uh, been able to develop the new rating for robotics. But in the end, um, talent management has to do what, just, what uh, Zach said. Try to find the passion point for that person and what he or she's working because, and then continue the continuous learning process of always making sure that he or she is, is current. The problem, of course, is that we have to man ships and man forces and that is a quantitative issue of mathematics and, and just try, trying to do the management of a large organization. So there has to be this constant conversation about what we value, and there's gotta be some revamping and some transforming of how we manage people. Because right now, 
we're managing scarcity at a fairly well when it comes to recruiting. But when it comes to, re to retaining, right now we're not doing badly because there's a newfound sense of purpose and there's a, a, a new set of leaders who are truly trying to, 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 to change it up a little bit. So I think it's a combination of, of talent management structure and the ethos and, and, and the purpose that, that we have. And there is an exquisite requirement for industry and the services to come together and really work this piece. If, they, if our people see that happening, they're not going to feel as though they are losing their edge. They're not going to feel as though they're losing their currency and they see the nation working together. I think that that's about it. I think the lights are going out. Thank Perfect. you, ma'am. Great answer. I, I hate to close this down. It's been a great conversation and thank the audience for your questions and, uh, and the panel members for this uh, really insightful conversation. So on behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA International, somewhere here I have a book. Um, I have a Naval Institute press book, U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century, A New Strategy for Facing the Chinese and Russian Threat by Brent Sadler. Uh, thank you all again and one more round of applause for our panelists, please.